Well, thanks everybody for coming here today, and um, especially thanks to uh, the jury. Um, I'm glad to present uh, the work I did during uh, my PhD, in <coughs> entitled Adaptive Personalization of Pedagogical Sequence uses Using Machine Learning. So it's a long name, but it basically means trying to make computer great teachers. So I will uh, first introduce the context of the PhD. After, I will present what uh, we called an activity and uh, what kind of object we will manipulate and we manage with the method <laughs> I developed during the PhD. And to manage these activities, I will, pre I will present how we evaluate which one are relevant. After that, I will present the different contribution <coughs> of the PhD, which are uh, mainly an architecture to manage pedagogical activities, and also several, ex several experimentations uh, used to evaluate this architecture and uh, different algorithms we developed based on it. I will finish by conclude on uh, some perspective and uh, <coughs> different work that uh, used uh, the, um, the algorithm we developed during the PhD. So, everybody is different. We are different in our ages, in our skin colors, or in our cultural background. But more importantly, we are different in the way, in the way we learn. At school, there is one teacher for a lot of students, and he has to um, make the students learn the best. Yeah, 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 he, he can try to uh, adapt the different thing, the different activities for each student, but it is a very hard work. And a lot of time, a lot of students don't uh, succeed well in school or have difficulties to learn different things due to the fact um, it is not adapted to them. So, intelligent tutoring systems have been proposed to try to answer this problem. So, intelligent tutoring systems are based on four basic components. The first one is the domain model. It's called the domain model. And so, uh, it contains the information about uh, the domain to be learned. So basically for uh, mathematical activities, it will contain how uh, the, ma the, the activities are structured, what are the more difficult, the less difficult, etc. After that, there is a student model, which is used to uh, retrieve the information about the student, what activities did he do, uh, we can try <coughs> inside the student model, there can also be um, evaluation of the student skills and uh, different other dimension. There is the, also the tutoring model. So the tutoring model is the part of the system that will use the domain model and the student model to propose the activity to the students and try to adapt and propose the best activities. Lastly, there is, there is the user interface model which provides the interaction and the information to the learner while uh, training and uh, studying. So this PhD is more focused on the tutoring model. How can we propose and adapt activities to each particular student? So a lot of work has been made in uh, this field to, um, to improve learning uh, for, uh, for each student or to improve motivation. But there have been very few work that try to do both, to at the same time improve learning and motivation. And so the question is, how can we adapt activities for each particular student to foster learning and motivation at the same time? So first, what do we call an activity? So <coughs> how do we define it? To define an activity, during this PhD, we defined an activity space, which is parameterized. So there can, there, there are different, there can be different parameters, for example, a type of activity, 
And these parameters will, will have different values. So we can imagine for a, a mathematical activity, you, ca you have uh, addition, subtraction, or multiplication. And for each type of activity, you will have different level of difficulty. For example, we'll have simple number, or more difficult number, or you can also have decimals. Lately, <coughs> uh, you can have more um, parameters that are independent from the other one, which will be more modalities, as the presentation. So for example, there can be uh, numbers or more symbolic uh, representation of the problem. And so what we call an activity is the, com the combination of particular values for each different parameter. So for example, an addition with, uh, with the um, level two difficulty and with a symbolic representation. And so the activity space will um, contain all the possible activities that can be uh, computed this way. And so now the question is, what are the relevant activities? What are the ones that foster learning and motivation? How can we evaluate them? So there have been several theories in psychology which proposed uh, ways to, um, to analyze this phenomenon. And for example, the theory of flow, which has been proposed by Ching Sent Mihai, and which postulates <laughs> <laughs> the fact that um, the activities uh, that are the more relevant for the students are the ones that present um, an optimal challenge. So the more the skill of the, of the student will be high, the more the challenge, and the lower the skill, the lower the challenge. And, th and so there is an area where the student will be in what is called the state of flow. Uh, in which when the activity presents an optimal change, it will be totally engaged and intrinsically motivated to do the activity. So b based on this <coughs> uh, theory, the learning progress hypothesis uh, has been proposed to model uh, the way kids uh, developed. How do they develop? How do they explore their environment? And uh, how they do it intrinsically motivated. So basically, the kids explore activities that provide them learning progress. They provide them uh, information about the world and permit them to uh, expand their, their knowledge. And this kind of theories can also be applied to robots. So how do we make robots explore, for example, their sensory motor space to make them learn how to, uh, how to use um, their different uh, arm or legs. So the concept of uh, the hypothesis is that if you have different activities, for example, if you have four activities, the one that presents the more learning progress, if you have difficult, really easy, and more medium difficulty activities, the one that presents um, medium and so challenging uh, perspective will be the one chosen by the, the kids to, um, to do. They will choose the one that presents a bit of change uh, and that presents linear progress in, in which they will learn. This, this works have been, have been developed in uh, neuroscience and uh, psychology and was uh, published in uh, several uh, reviews. So, now that we have a way to analyze activities that seems relevant, can this theory be transposed to educational theories? Can we use the learning progress hypothesis to evaluate um, the relevance of activity? And also, another question is that, does learning progress alone generate learning efficiency and motivation? And does choice, because basically kids choose what they want to do, does giving choice to the learners bring something additional in um, educational technologies. <laughs> so now that we have a way to evaluate the quality of the activity, the, the relevance, how to manage them? If there are several activities that give learning progress, that permit students to be 
motivating and to learn, which uh, do we choose? So to re respond to this problem, we used multi bandit algorithm. <laughs> so multi bandit is the name for basically slot machines. So it's a class of problems which 2D, if you have several uh, slot machines, which gives you money or take back money, you want to try to uh, maximize your, uh, the money you have at the end. So you will play to several different machines. And after some time, you will be able to infer which is the machine that gives you the more money. Here the analogy is that we have no more slot machines, but we have activity parameters and activity values. And we don't know one, we, sorry, <coughs> we don't want to maximize mo the reward in money, but we want to maximize the learning progress. And so based on the learning progress and multi embodied algorithm, we proposed an architecture which called hierarchical multi bandit for intelligent tutoring system. So it's based on a parameterized activity space <coughs> and it will exploit the activities that can be generated inside this space by estimating the learning progress for each parameter value. And we will use multi bandit to explore and exploit the relevant activities. So during the PhD, we proposed two different implementations of this architecture. The first one has more cognitive approach. It's called the right activity at the right time. And so <coughs> it, re it requires a definition of skill, of skill level, which corresponds to the skill required to succeed the activity. And so based on the result of the student, the, um, the algorithm will be able to evaluate the activities that give um, progress in skills. For example, um, for uh, mathematical, mathematical, sorry, mathematical activities, le, um, the, the algorithm for the, for, oh, oh, I will go there. Okay, it's not that. So, for mathematical, for example, for addition, subtraction, you will have different skills. And uh, you will be able to evaluate uh, the learning progress of the student for the different skills. The other approach is more empirical and called zone of proximal development and empirical success. So the, here uh, we want to use a more simpler uh, model of uh, the domain and it's only based on the graph of activity. And uh, the algorithm will compute the success rate for each, um, for each activities. And based on the success rate, we'll uh, compute the learning progress. The thing is, the first approach um, requires a lot of work from uh, the pedagogical expert. Because to develop the different uh, algorithm, we need experts that will uh, give the information about the domain. And so the first approach requires a lot of work. And so we set it aside. We set it aside. And the example uh, I will present during the PhD are based on uh, ZPDUS. So the step for, ZP, for ZPDUS uh, start by generating an activity from the different parameters, as I explained earlier. This generation will be based on the quality of the parameter. So we define the quality, if the activity is relevant or not. And based on this quality, the, the values will be sampled proportionally, proportionally to this quality. After the activity has been generated, we will get the inner answer. And based on this answer, based on this answer we'll compute the learning progress. So for example, for ZPDUS, we will compare the most, the most recent um, activities with a bit uh, older ones. And at the end, we will update the quality of the parameters based on the learning progress. And a new activity will be generated, uh, the student will answer, and so on. So for example, if we take back the example for, for familiar. We can have um, 
different quality for addition, subtraction, and multiplication. And so if the quality of the addition is way upper than the other one, it, it, will, it will have more probability to be sampled. So we can take the example where the addition is sampled. So now, what level do we, do? Do we take for this, um, this type of activity? Again, <laughs> the quality of the real one is higher. So it has more probability to be sampled. So let's say, okay, where is it sampled? And lastly, the presentation of the activity will also be chose. Here, we can see that there is the, the probability of the weak close, but we can imagine the case where the highest is also sampled. But there could be cases where it's the lowest probability activity that are sampled, because the algorithm is made to explore also uh, the, the, all the space of activity. But one problem remains. <coughs> when the student start to work, <coughs> he can he can uh, he can be proposed activities that are way higher than his own level. And so, as we saw earlier, that, that can create anxiety in them. So, to solve this problem, we add a new component in our architecture, which are a set of rules to manage what we call the zone of proximal development. Meaning, the, the, the student will be kept in, a, in an area of activities where we are sure he, he, he will have uh, a challenge like that is neither too high or, or too low. And so this rule will permit to activate and deactivate the parameters based on, for example, the um, success rate of the student for the PDS. So here, if we take back the, the case, we can imagine that the student will start by the addition with a really simple number. and all the presentations are available beca because we didn't um, define any hierarchical difficulty between them. And so the student will work with uh, these this activities. And at some point, he will have um, enough success, success, success to activate the next level of difficulty. And so the zone of proximal development, which is in yellow, will expand and allow the student to make more diverse activities. And after some time, if the student totally masters the level one, F and his uh, success rate is really high, the level one will be deactivated and will be no more proposed because it doesn't give learning progress anymore to the student. So now that we have the, uh, this architecture and the different algorithm we developed, how can we validate its impact on learning and motivation? How can we be sure that it is relevant to manage the activities? So to, to make this evaluation, we build two kinds of experimentation. First one is in virtual environment with models of learners. And the second kind, so in simulation, basically. And the second type of uh, experimentation is with real learners in uh, in classrooms. So we, we went to classrooms with uh, we set our tablets and we, we made uh, experimentation with real kids. And so we also, mean, we also need means of comparison. So for example, references to what do we compare our algorithm. And we also need metrics to be able to evaluate different components. So the first experimentation I will uh, speak about is a, is a comparison between ZPDS and PondDP server. So, uh, PondDP solver. PondDP means partially observable Markovian decision process. So it's a class of problem where an agent <coughs> try to select the best action to achieve a goal inside an environment. But uh, the agent here doesn't know the real state of the environment. He only has observation about this environment. And so the agent will build belief and try to take the best action to reach the goal without knowing the real state. So it is to this kind of uh, problem we will compare ZPDS because in this case, 
the state will be um, the state of the learner. Does he master the knowledge or not? And so the PomDP server will, will generate belief about the state of the learner and try to uh, select the best activity to propose to make the learner learn. <laughs> so in, th in this simulation, we also used a learner model. So basically, we need um, a model of the learner that will learn through the different algorithms. This model is based on knowledge tracing, which is a well-known um, model in the literature. So it is composed of several learnable knowledge. For each knowledge, the student have an initial probability of mastering it. And also, the student, when uh, making an activity, have a probability of learning and also have a probability of guess or sleep depending on his mastery of, of the knowledge. So basically, he can give a good answer even if he does not master the knowledge, and he, ga he can give a false answer even if he master it. But we added a uh, little modification in our model, which is dependencies between the knowledge. For example, here, a simplified representation of this model. So we have a, a, a student that has this knowledge he can uh, learn. And so all the knowledge are um, hierarchically dependent between them. So he will need to master the first knowledge to be able to learn the second one, and etc. and so on. And basically, we have a 20% chance to learn each uh, knowledge if he masters the one needed for. Only the first one doesn't need another knowledge to be mastered. And so this model is the one used to train the PondDP solver. And so the PondDP solver should propose the optimal solution uh, when uh, the, the student that is trying to learn follows the same model, that, uh, follows the same model than the one used to train it. But uh, so what we are interested in is when the students are different. Basically, in real life, uh, as I said, everybody learns differently. And so how do, can we model uh, this difference in a population of uh, virtual learners? So the first possibility is to change the probability of transition, guess, and sleeping. For example, that is the uh, uh, basic model. But uh, the probability of transition could be 10% uh, or 30% and not 20%. And so in the population, <coughs> in the heterogeneous population, the probability will follow uh, a normal distribution around uh, 20%. The other way to modify this model is to change <coughs> the dependencies between uh, the knowledge. For example, Maybe there is a student that doesn't need to master the first knowledge to learn the second one. And so the dependencies between the, dif the, between the knowledge will change. And so with these two types of possible modification, we, will, we have generated five different uh, models. We have made five different models. And inside the population, we will combine these different models and see how the algorithm uh, works when they try to adapt uh, the activities. So, as I said, for the experimental simulation, we have two types of population. So the first type, all of the students inside the population follow the same model with the same probabilities. And so for this kind of population, PondDP should present uh, optimal solution. The second type of population, students follow three different levels, so three different models, sorry. And, uh, and the probabilities are also perturbated. So the second type of simulation presents heterogeneous population. We will, and we will compare three types of algorithms. So the first type is the PomDP solver, which is characterized by one student model. The second alg algorithm is ZPDS star, which is 
um, a version of ZP that, that has been optimized uh, for one particular model. So close to be to the PomDP server. And the last algorithm is ZPDS H, which is a generic version of ZPDS where the parameters are the ones we chose, for example, for the real classroom experiment. And to compare this three algorithm, we will measure the over sorry, the average knowledge level over all the population. So for the first type of simulation, when all the students in the population follow one model, we can see that, so in blue, there is a PomDP, in black, it's ZPDS star, and in red, it's uh, ZPDS H. <laughs> the purple uh, curve uh, is random, so when the activity is basically proposed random. So what we can see is that PomDP and ZPDS star, here and here, yeah, they are pretty close and uh, present a good solution for uh, the models that have been trained for. And you can see that ZPDSH is a bit slower. It makes the population slow, lower, uh, slower because due to, its, uh, due to the fact that it explores more the, the graph and is less reactive than the other um, algorithm. For the second type of population, of simulations, <laughs> when uh, the population is heterogeneous with different models and different probabilities, what we can see is that the performances of two different algorithms are very close. And in fact, ZPSH uh, is kind of really similar to the other one. Here it's when the student model, so 0, 1, and 2, these student models are really close the one to each one to each other. But there is another case when the student mo the models are really different. And in this case, we can see that ZPSH, to, due to its more capability to adapt, will make the population learn more efficiently. So what we saw is that ZPDS is really close to PomDP when they are optimized for one single model. And ZPDS presents better performances than the PomDP server uh, confronted to a general heterogeneous populations. So ZPDS seems a good alternative to PomDP. It is computationally efficient because if you don't train it uh, for a particular model, it doesn't need training. You just have to uh, choose parameters. It is based on a really simple student model, as I presented before, and it has shown great adaptability to different kinds of models. So now, what about ZPDS in real life? Does it work with kids in classrooms? So during the PhD, we did two campaigns of experimentation in classrooms for a total of 1,000 students in Bordeaux school district, and a total of six months of the experimentation in school. So we basically went to the schools in the classroom with computers, Wi-Fi router, and a set of 30 tablets. And uh, we made the student work on the tablets. I will present more in detail the last experimentation. So this experimentation is about 600 students between seven and eight years old, and eight years. And there are four types of activity. Each student did four sessions separated by uh, two or four days. And uh, this session was around one hour. And we compared five experimental conditions. So we have five uh, different algorithms that manage the activities to the student. And you have three main types of metric to evaluate and compare the, this algorithm. So the activity and the scenario we built was about uh, client and mansion situation for the student. So they basically had to compose a sum with a bill and coin 
or give the change to a client. <laughs> so they could have been one object to buy, two objects, or uh, give back the money for one object or two objects. And the difficulty of uh, the exercises uh, was based on uh, the sum to compose. So basically, if you have to compose for you, it's really easy. You just have to take two, um, two coin of two. But if you want to, to compute uh, a number with decimals and a more difficult number, it will be way more difficult for the student. And at this age, they uh, did not forcefully uh, study decimals uh, at school. So it can present uh, several difficulties for them. And so now, we have five different condition algorithms that manage these activities. The first uh, condition uh, is based on an expert sequence. So it's called XPSEC. And is a predefined sequence based on psychological theories, where the student will uh, do the activities linearly and uh, will proceed to the next activity when it is evaluated that he master uh, the one he is doing. So we use this sequence as a reference. The sequence of, uh, the sequence of activity was made with a ex pedagogical expert, and uh, we use it as a reference to compare to the other algorithm. So the second algorithm is ZPDS, the one I presented before. The third algorithm is called ZPDRD. So this one is a version of ZPDS where the um, activities are no more proposed based on the learning progress, but are based randomly, or proposed randomly, which means there are still the mechanism <laughs> to activate and deactivate the activities, but uh, inside the ZPD, the activities that are proposed are no more based on learning progress, but it will follow a normal distribution. And so we use this algorithm to uh, evaluate the impact of using learning progress inside ZPDS. So we also want to see what is the impact of giving choice to the student. So for that, we propose two different uh, algorithms. The first one uh, is an algorithm, so ZCU, where the student will have choice between two different objects. So there are no impact on the pedagogical value of the activity, but the student will be able to, to choose an object he prefer. So it's a contextual choice. <laughs> the second um, algorithm which proposed choice is about a choice of activity. For here, for example, ZPDS will sample the two different activities, uh, giving back money or being a client, and the student will be able to choose between these two. The object is not shown to uh, not um, put bias, as there's here, that maybe the child could choose based on the object and not the activity. <laughs> so the goals of this experimentation are to evaluate uh, the impact of three different factors on learning and the motivation of the children. The first thing is the impact of the different algorithm. What is the impact of each algorithm on the learning and the motivation? The second is the fact that giving choice, does giving choice actually uh, make the student more motivated and learn better? And the third um, thing we want to see is, uh, is the correlation between the particular characteristic characteristics of the students and their learning and their motivation, or between the, their particular characteristic and uh, the impact of the different algorithm. So we did three main types of metrics to uh, evaluate this, um, this experimentation. The first one is to retrieve personal information of the students as the mathematical level, or uh, the usage of a digital device at home, or also uh, their self-determination trait, 
which is basically, <coughs> do they choose often in their real life? Do they choose what they do? Do they choose what they eat? Do they choose uh, what activity, etc.? And so that can permit to dress a kind of uh, profile of the student. The second type of uh, measure is about their performance. So first, what are the activities they made? What uh, difficulty of activity did they reach? Did they succeed? And we have also a comparison, comparison <coughs> between a pre and a post and a post test. So they did a test before doing the, the, the session, and they did another test after doing the session. And the comparison between these two tests will, will allow to uh, see if they learned and was able to transfer what they did during the sessions. The last type of metrics is about their motivation. So <coughs> to measure their, their motivation, we have a short questionnaire after each, each session. And we have a larger questionnaire at the end to evaluate the <coughs> external motivation extrinsic motivation, sorry, and intrinsic motivation. So here, the first result I'm presenting is about the score of the student uh, over the activities they made during their training session. So <coughs> here, in abs <coughs> we have the time. So the time represents the activities they made. So at time 60, for example, that means the students, I made 16 activities. It's not about minutes or seconds, but it's about the steps during the training session. And the score is here, correspond to uh, the diversity and the difficulty of the activities the students made inside the population. So we can see that first, the ones that present the best course are the students that work with uh, the ZPDS algorithm and add the choice of object. So they seem to have the, to have the one that uh, reach the, best, uh, the highest level of activity. It is followed by the, by the student uh, working with um, ZPDS and ZPDRD. So we chose the classical algorithm and its version uh, where the activities are chosen randomly. It's followed just after by uh, the students that worked with the condition that the choice of object, of uh, activity, sorry. And lastly, uh, the expert sequence presents the lowest performance. And so propose less diverse and less difficult activities to the students. The second graph is uh, really close to the first one, but the score here is just not about the activities they reached, but it's pondered by the success uh, rate at each of the activities they made. So the score here, so here we was looking at what activity did they do without taking into account if they succeed or not. But here we are looking at, okay, even if they did a lot of act different activities and difficult one, did they actually succeed them? And what we can see is that the student working with uh, the condition with the choice of object are still the ones that perform better. They are the ones that have the highest success rate pondered by the different activities made. <coughs> it is followed by the three other algorithms. And you can see that here, the choice of activity is really close. And even if, I don't know if you see well, but here, uh, it is even upper than the two other conditions. So even if the student reach less uh, difficult uh, activities, this is a, their, um, their score about the success they made is close to the other one. And lastly, the student working with the expert sequence uh, performed or, or <coughs> always slower, lower than the other. So now we compare the pre and post test uh, results of the student. So here we have the expert sequence. <laughs> the ZPDRD here is about uh, so, um, the random uh, selection. ZPDS, choice of object, and cho of choice of activity. So over all the population, we can see that there is no significant differences. But one, something that is interesting 
in that if you looked at uh, the self determined su student, so the one that uh, have the habits to make choice in their life, the student with the expert seconds uh, have performed and learned and transfer knowledge a uh, lot less than uh, the student working with the other um, algorithm based on the PDS. Lately, <coughs> lastly, uh, if we look at the final intrinsic, uh, the final intrinsic uh, motivational score, uh, the self-determined student uh, were more motivated by, with the, the condition uh, based on the PDS. And we, if we look at the non-self-determined st student, we can see that uh, this student was even motivated, evenly motivated with uh, expert seconds than uh, the other ones, at the exception of the condition where the activity was uh, selected randomly. So for non-self-determined uh, non student, uh, the fact that the activity or sampled randomly seems to be to have a negative effect on their motivation. So these are still preliminary, preliminary results. We uh, didn't have time to exploit all the data, but it is really interesting. It shows that learning progress and contextual choice present a really great um, impact on learning and the motivation of the student. And here we have so, we have so th we, we saw that the choice of activity didn't present uh, that much advantages, but that can be explained due to the fact that the student was really young, and in fact maybe they couldn't understand the impact of, of the choice. When we we could uh, saw that during the class the classroom uh, session, some uh, student was just uh, selecting randomly in fact the activities he was making or some was always uh, focusing on the easy one or the difficult one. So maybe that's one of the explanation of, uh, the, <coughs> of the result obtained with the choice of activity. And we also see that uh, learning progress alone seems really interesting because when uh, the activities are, are chosen randomly and not based on the learning progress, for part of the population, uh, they, they were less motivated. So there is a lot of other analysi analysis that can be made, and uh, we are working on it. So during this PhD, we produced an architecture to dynamically manage activi pedagogical activities to maintain students motivated and make them learn very well. We implemented this architecture into two different algorithms and tested them in uh, classrooms and simulations. We developed several metrics to evaluate uh, this algorithm. And as I said, uh, we did a lot of experimentation to evaluate them. And so now, what, what can we say more? <coughs> so this algorithm seems effect e efficient to make people learn. Is a, so for mathematical, uh, for mathematical, mathem for mathematical <laughs> For mathematical problems, but uh, as in uh, the learning progress hypothesis, which was based for kids and a robot, which was exploring their sensory motor uh, space, it can also be used to uh, to learn how to drive. For example, I think it has been used uh, in this way uh, in some experiment, or uh, even or, may or maybe it can even teach you how to make a great coffee. But there is uh, some kind of problems that it could be not as relevant. For example, if you want to write a dissertation in the French or in any languages, you don't have uh, easy ways to evaluate qualitatively and quantitatively the progress of the student. So for this kind of problems, our approach may be not as relevant as uh, other kind of approach. Also, there are algorithm limitations uh, in the computing of the learning progress, for example, which is the really uh, difficult part and tricky part of the algorithm implementation, because we have to find ways to um, extract the information of the student learning from his result or his behavior. 
And so this part can require a lot of work to be uh, in, uh, improved and uh, see several ways to make it different. What we are doing next is uh, we, are, we want to uh, work on, uh, on a platform to uh, allow the community to reproduce, to reproduce our work. Uh, so to build a platform where there will be all the protocols, all the data, and the different tools we used to uh, make our experimentations. And also, we are, work, we are looking uh, for industrial transfer and uh, deploying uh, our approach in other cases. Actually, in uh, parallel to this thesis, a lot of different work had been made using ZPDS as a platform to teach uh, asthmatic kids about uh, their disease and their treatment. Also, as I said earlier, it has also been used in a driver uh, simulator to teach people how to drive. And so we are looking to, to this. This is one of the um, force of this approach, is that it seems to be easily uh, used in several domains and uh, be deployed really easy. Uh, 